Hi, welcome to the Intentional Equity Framework. My name is Jeff Jordan, president and founder of Rescue Agency, the behavior change agency. And I'm really excited to share with you today how it is that we infuse equity into every single one of our programs from research to implementation and evaluation. Now, Rescue Agency has been around for over 20 years, and we've been focused from day one exclusively on positive health behavior change campaigns on topics such as tobacco, nutrition, maternal health, substances, marijuana, sexual health, and alcohol use. We have over 180 full-time staff across North America that are all exclusively focused on these challenges. And we provide services to our government and nonprofit clients like research, strategy, creative, media implementation, and evaluation. Now, what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is something that has been a critical part of Rescue Agency from day one, and that is the creation and delivery of equitable programs. Rescue Agency was founded in order to reach those who need more support more effectively. That initial seed grew into strategies that have helped us reach all sorts of populations more equitably throughout the years. And today we've packaged all of that education into our new intentional equity framework that I'm really excited to share with you today. Well, we know that everybody, uh, hopefully all of you watching this video, are all striving for equitable programs every day. But there's a big fallacy in when it comes to equity. And that is the assumption that if we're not being purposely inequitable, that we are by definition equitable. Well, unfortunately that's not how it works. Equity cannot be achieved passively. Equity can only be achieved with intentionality at every single step of the program development and implementation process. Because equity goes against the grain. You have to swim upstream to create an equitable program. And that means you have to know what it is that you're trying to change. So let's take a step back and first make sure that we're on the same page about what equity within public health and health communications actually is. For us, equity means needs-based impact. What does that mean? It means that people who need more support from us are the ones that are actually receiving more impact from a program. We know that equity is actually achieved when every person can attain their full health potential. Due to historic marginalization, systemic racism, and limited education and economic opportunities, many people need more support to achieve this goal. And so the greater a person's need, the more support that they should receive from a health communications program. And that's why we define equity within health communications as not just what we try to do, but it's what we achieve, that we actually achieve a greater level of impact amongst those that have a greater level of need from our programs. Now, it's really important to get on the same page that equity and equality are not the same thing. Now you may think, well, yeah, I know this. I've seen all the, all the cartoons and illustrations that demonstrate that equity and equality are different. But here's the thing. There's a lot that happens within public health that's focused on equality um, at the cost of equity, namely, Things like, our campaign is designed to reach everyone. We're trying to deliver our campaign to everybody. We're trying to make messages that appeal to everybody. Anytime that we use language like everybody, that means we're not being equitable, we're being equal. And unfortunately, within public health, being equal does not cause equitable outcomes. Why is that? Well, we know that people are impacted by systemic barriers and have had limited access to our resources. And these inequities have contributed to different health behaviors and outcomes today. So before our program even starts, before we get out into the community, there are already inequities present that require us to take a different approach in order to be equitable. Programs that focus on equality end up over-delivering to audiences with fewer needs and under-delivering to audiences with higher needs, right? If we're delivering the same message to everybody, if we're saying we want to reach everybody and we're showing them our commercial or our program the same number of times, then that means that we're giving the same amount no matter the level of need. Now, that might be what you intend. Um, equality might be your goal, but equality does not achieve equity. And so if you are someone that wants health equity ingrained within your program, we've got to get rid of that language. We can't say that our program is for everybody. We can't say that we're trying to reach everybody equally. We can't say we're trying to make messages for everybody. We have to start using the language of equity within health communications. And that means understanding who our audience is and what it is that we need to say to those who have greater need. Because a program that is not intentionally equitable is unfortunately unintentionally inequitable, right? When we deliver equal program to everybody, we end up uh, perpetuating the current in inequities that exist because we haven't done anything to address those who need more versus those who need less. So the first step, obviously, in order to deliver an equitable program is to understand, well, who are the people who need more, right? Who needs more support? So 
there's a lot of different options of how we can define these populations. Um, obviously, demographics is the first one that, that comes to mind, and demographics can be really useful in understanding at kind of a bird's eye level why some of these inequities exist. But if you really want to get in there and understand why is it that this population or these individuals need more support than others, you've got to go beyond demographics. And you've got to get into psychographics, into their experiences, their lived experiences, the circumstances that surround their life, things from built environment to the structure, to the government, to everything that's going on around them, to the behaviors that they might be engaging in. Um, all of these different pieces help us understand why some individuals need more support. Plus, we have to acknowledge the intersectionality between some of these factors because that may require that we have multiple layers of support, not just through our program, but through some of our partners and stakeholders. So we have to figure out what are the variables that we're going to use in order to define who our real audience is, right? That means we've got to go beyond age and race and geographic area and start to define what are some of those characteristics that tell us someone needs more support. Now, as we think about this segmentation of how we're going to reach our audiences, we have to keep in mind that the effectiveness of an actual segmentation variable, those descriptors that we're using to define who our program's audience actually is, that the effectiveness of those variables depends on how relevant those variables are to a program, right? So for example, let's say that a program wants to use race as a specific variable to define their audience. That may be fine, maybe not. The question is, how much does race have to do with the health behavior that you're actually trying to target? If race has nothing to do with that health behavior, then that particular variable is not an effective variable to better understand those who are more in need. Another variable like maybe lived experience might be more closely tied to why someone is engaging in the health behavior that you don't want them to engage in. And so then that other variable is actually more effective uh, segmentation tool in order to truly reach your audience. So it's not just about segmentation for the sake of segmentation, it's about trying to create a concentrated group of individuals who need more support from us so that we can ensure a program is designed to deliver equitable outcomes to that audience. We have to understand as we define these variables and define our audience, the structural inequities that exist within the community that are actually going to affect how we deliver our campaign. The reality is, is that even when programs strive to be equal, they end up being inequitable because of the structural inequities that exist within marketing itself, right? So speaking to everyone is more effective with people who need less support. What does that mean? Think about a message that just simply tells you to eat healthier, okay? Well, if I have more education, I have more money, I have more time, more access, someone telling me I should eat healthier is a lot easier for me to adopt than someone who has less access, less, less disposable income, less uh, education and knowing how to cook these foods, where to get them, et cetera, right? So that message that was designed to be as simple as possible to be general and to reach everybody ends up only being something that those with less need can actually take advantage of, right? Because those who, who didn't have all those obstacles can just listen to that message and take action. But those who have a bunch of obstacles to being able to take advantage of that message, hear it and say, well, I don't know how to do that. I can't do that, right? So these general messages actually disproportionately are more effective with those who have less needs, exasperating the existing inequities. And on top of that, media channels disproportionately cater to people who need less support, right? Think about the commercial world. The commercial world is designed to reach individuals who have the most money to spend. And so what does that mean is that it's individuals with higher incomes, with higher education levels, et cetera, who are the ones who are really catered to within the commercial marketing world. Now we have to use commercial marketing to reach our audience. And so what does that mean is that by default, commercial marketing tools and best practices end up reaching those with less need more frequently, more directly than those who have greater need. What does that all add up to? is that when you are striving for equality, you end up actually with an inequitable program because of the way that messages are received and because of the way that they are delivered within the current structure of marketing that we operate in. Marketing is structurally inequitable? What, what do we mean by that? Let's dig in a little bit more because I know that that's a pretty bold thing to say. Think about it this way. Commercial marketing was built to sell goods and services, right? No one can deny that. And the marketing tools and best practices that marketers use have been perfected based on the best ways to sell those goods and services to those with the greatest buying power, right? So commercial marketers, by default, create inequitable campaigns because inequity 
is usually the most profitable uh, strategy for commercial companies, right? So think about, you're trying to sell a certain product. Do you want your message to be delivered equitably to those who have less income, who have less access to your product, maybe less use for your product? No, you want your message to be delivered inequitably. You want it to go to the people who have the most money in order to buy your product and you know, deliver profits to your shareholders. And that's how commercial marketing generally operates. Now, there of course are some products that are designed for low, lower income individuals. Many of these products have taken advantage of some of those populations, things like tobacco, things like unhealthy foods, et cetera. But for the most part, the vast majority of commercial marketing has been designed to reach the middle class. And until recently has been designed to reach more men, has been designed to reach more Caucasians, has been designed to reach more well-educated, has been designed to reach those uh, with higher incomes, right? So all of these factors have been built into how the commercial marketing world operates for decades. And so when we come in with our mission to deliver an equitable health program, we are faced with entrenched norms and strategies that are quote, successful, but that success has been, is defined based on selling products to middle class and educated people and is not necessarily based on what is necessary to ensure that our campaign reaches those with the greatest need. So what that means is that it just further exasperates this need to be intentionally equitable if we're actually going to achieve equitable outcomes with our programs. So what does a program um, that is equitable actually look like? Well, that's why I'm excited today to introduce you to the Intentional Equity Framework, because we've built this framework to help public health organizations and our partners around the country understand what equity means and what it looks like within health communications and marketing. So the first thing we ask with Intentional Equity is we ask, well, who is it that needs more support and why is it that they need the most support? Right? We want to understand what is it, what's going on in their lives, what has happened around them, um, you know, how has systems and things affected them that resulted in them needing more support from us. Because the more we understand the problem, the more effectively we can cater to it. Next, we want to understand how do we speak to this audience in a way that caters the most to the groups who need the more support from us without excluding, excluding others. Right? Segmentation within public health is not about exclusion. Segmentation is about inclusion. It's about how do we make sure that we include those who, are, who have the greatest need. And so what that means is that we have to understand, well, what cues do they look like? Who are they listening to? What commercials are they ignoring and which ones are they paying attention to? You have to keep in mind that this audience um, lives in a world where a lot of marketing is not tailored to them. So they've been used to ignoring marketing for, for their whole life pretty much because it, it doesn't apply to them for various reasons. So how can you make a, a message, a commercial, a radio ad, whatever it is that you're making in a way that actually catches their attention and gets them to listen? And then how do we ensure that our messages are actually delivered more frequently to those who need the message more and less to those who need the message less, right? Because the only way we're going to actually achieve equitable outcomes, which means greater outcomes amongst those who have greater need is to ensure that our program is disproportionately delivered to those with greater need. So how do we do this? Well, there's three pillars to intentional equity. The first is called applied empathy. Now, we all consider ourselves empathetic people, hopefully, that's why we work in public health. But do we actually apply that empathy to the strategies that we make, to the messages that we design, right? To, do we apply a deep understanding of the audience into how we are asking them to change, what we are asking of them? And that's what applied empathy is. Right? It's about psychographic segmentation that focuses on what actually drives the person's behavioral decisions, opportunities where health promotion can make a difference, and the obstacles we must help them overcome. Because equitable health communications is not about telling people what to do. Equitable health communications is about helping people change those things that, that will make their lives better. Right? We have to be helpful because that's the only way that those who are most in need are going to actually achieve equitable outcomes. Now, after we have that applied empathy through our research, through our deeper understanding of the audience, we have to create authentic narratives. And authentic narratives is storytelling that associates relevant values of the people who need most support with targeted behaviors while helping them overcome the real world obstacles um, to change that they face. We, we like to think of these as burdens, right? Changing any behavior has its burdens, whether it's time, cost, not understanding how to do it, et cetera. Your campaign should strive to alleviate some of these burdens. How can you make change easier for your audience? 
And the only way to do that is going back to applied empathy is to actually understand what it would take for them to change. Right? So this isn't just about understanding who your audience is, what their preferences are, they like this color, they like this music, whatever. No, we're not talking about shallow market research uh, insights. We are talking about a deep understanding of what is their life look like and what would change actually look like. So that when you're designing your messages, you're actually guiding them through a pathway to change that is realistic for them in their life. And then finally, the third pillar is called needs-based implementation. And this is the idea that media distribution uses audience characteristics to ensure media delivery and dosage increase with the need for support, often working against the structural algorithms and how actual commercial media is actually structured. Because remember, like we talked about earlier, it's structured to, to reach people who have greater buying power. And that's not what public health is worried about. So oftentimes you have to develop media strategies that go against the norm, that go against the best practices, that go against what a lot of media buyers are probably recommending to you, but that's not what you should be doing. So let's talk about it a little bit more in detail. Achieving health equity dictates that equity is only possible when it is intentionally uh, infused from the beginning of campaign development. Applied empathy helps us understand who needs the most support. Authentic narratives help us speak to people who need the most support. And needs-based implementation ensures that we reach the people who need that support. So going back to our wonderful illustration here, what does that look like? It, it doesn't mean we're excluding everybody. Everybody is still getting a little bit of the message. But the more someone needs that support from us, the more they're getting from that program as uh, reflected through those boxes there, right? So this is what the outcome looks like of what we want to achieve. How do we do it? Well, applied empathy means that we begin by understanding who needs the most support and why they actually need that support. What happened? What's going on in their lives? What are the things that are holding them back from being able to engage in this healthy behavior? Then we have to ask ourselves, what is the most effective pathway to change for those who need the most support? Right? So this is about us actually solving the problem for them. If change is hard for them, we should know what that change actually looks like and what's realistic for them, right? So that means this is something we do at Rescue every single day. We sit down and we talk about if this population was actually going to do what we're asking them to do, what would that look like? How would they do it? What would they need to learn? What additional supports would they need? What would their life look like? What would, how would their family react? How would their neighbors react? What, all these variables that are involved in change, we take that burden on ourselves in order to craft the messages that are realistic for them to adopt. Too often, public health is about trying to tell people what to do and not helping them actually do it. Applied empathy is about helping people actually do it. And that means that our communications answer the one most important question, which is how will our communications reduce the burdens of change for those who need the support the most? If we can answer that question, then we're on our way to an equitable campaign. Now, the next piece is authentic narratives. So the first thing we do with authentic narratives is we say, well, how many messages do we need to be effective? Oftentimes, public health wants to have this one grand message that appeals to everybody. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, there's no such thing as a message that appeals to everybody, right? Everyone might think it's a nice message, but that doesn't mean that everyone can actually act upon it. And usually the more generic and general the message is, the more that those who are in need can't act upon it because it didn't address any of their specific needs. It just kind of generally told people what they should do and probably made them feel good about why they should do it and all of that. And it's like, yes, I agree with you. But agreeing with a commercial, agreeing with a you know, super creative public health commercial doesn't mean it helped you actually do any of what it's asking you to do. So we don't look for a single message. We ask honestly, who needs what message? And if that means we gotta make two messages, three messages, four messages, we're honest about that because we wanna actually help people be able to enact the change that we're asking them to enact. Now. We make sure that we craft the message that actually reduces the burdens of change for the specific audience that we're trying to reach. This might mean we have multiple audiences with multiple messages. And we make sure that we're honest with ourselves and with our partners and clients about what can our message realistically achieve. Sometimes public health tries to do too much with a commercial, too much with a single campaign. We have to be honest about where is our audience today? We know where we want them to get, but are there multiple steps to get there? And, can the, and should the campaign try to get them from A to Z or maybe just from A to B and then later from B to C and C to D, et cetera? Sometimes change takes time and your campaign is actually more effective trying to go step by step than trying to achieve everything at once that may be unrealistic to those who are most in need. 
And finally, we ask who should share this message, right? Who are the speakers? Who are the representatives of this message? What does the brand look like? What do the actors or, um, or real people look like? How do they talk? What's the background? What, what are the cues that are gonna let our audience know that this is actually for them? These are all critical parts of creating authenticity within the narratives that we put out there because we want them to know not only is this message for them, but this message is actually designed to help them, not to shame them, not to try and boss them around, not to act like a parent if we're talking to teens, but it's actually designed to help them be more of the kind of person that they wanna be and achieve the things that they wanna achieve in their life. And finally, needs-based implementation. So. In order to understand how to develop strategies that actually deliver more of your campaign to those who need it the most, we have to first recognize that media metrics are based on general populations and that people with greater needs are constantly underrepresented in those metrics. What does that mean? I'm sure you've all heard something from your media planner that says, we reached 80% of the population, 90% of the population. You might think, wow, that's so great, right? We reached nearly everybody in our community. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> usually that five, 10, 15, 20% that you didn't reach tends to be the, the group that needed you the most. Why? Because media is structurally designed to reach more of the individuals who have fewer needs, who have fewer needs for support, right? These are individuals who have greater incomes, greater education, um, are more middle class, et cetera. So in order to truly reach those at greatest needs, we kind of have to break out of this commercial marketing media planning world and develop our own world, our own world where we focus on those who are at greatest need. What does that mean? Is that we have to plan our media based on reaching the right audience and not based on impressions, don't even spend any time on impressions, and or even efficiency. This term media efficiency is, is a trick. It is a trick that tells us how do we reach the population in the least expensive way? Well, guess what? The more efficiency that we look for, the more we reach easy to reach people. And easy to reach people, while they may be the most profitable for the commercial world, they are usually the least in need of support within the public health world, right? So the more we cut corners on trying to buy cheap media, maximize impressions, try to reach you know, 90% of our population 30 times, et cetera, that is usually hiding the reality that those who need our message the most are barely getting it. And now that we use a lot of digital media, it gets even worse. Digital media algorithms have been built to sell products, right? So when we use things like uh, click-based media buys, where we're essentially trying to focus on people who click on our ads, those algorithms are designed to actually focus on the people most interested in a specific topic. Well, let's think about that from a public health perspective. Let's say that we're trying to get adults to stop smoking. Well, who's gonna be most interested in an ad about smoking cessation? it's actually probably not gonna be current smokers because a lot of them need to be convinced to take advantage of these, uh, of these items. It's gonna probably be other public health people, other people who maybe have a family member who smokes and things like that, but it's usually not going to be our core audience. And so what that does is the algorithm actually misdirects the campaign and pushes it more and more towards the people who don't need the message because the people who need the message the most in public health tend to be a little bit resistant, tend to be a little bit you know, thinking it's not for me or I can't do it or things like that. So there's a lot of digital algorithms that aren't designed for us. There's a lot of media metrics that aren't designed for us. And what that means is we have to write our own playbook of how to de deliver media to those who are at greatest need and really get away from a lot of these commercial marketing tactics that were not designed for us. And the most important thing to remember is that media efficiency does not equal effectiveness. These are two different words that have two very different meanings. And in fact, some of the most efficient media campaigns end up being some of the least effective ones. So you've heard about what the intentional equity framework means in theory. Let's take a look at what it means in practice. So I wanna show you an example from our nutrition work um, and wanna kind of start at where we started and where we ended up. So where we started was we were looking at a lot of different uh, campaigns that were working within nutrition and trying to figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't work for them. And what we saw was a lot of campaigns that look like this. To make wise food choices for you and your family, compare the nutrition information on food labels. Because healthy eating is worth it. Healthy eating. <laughs> it's for life. Learn how the nutrition facts table can help you choose healthier foods. Now, 
a lot of these campaigns um, ended up kind of looking a lot like this, which was showing individuals who had plenty of time to spend with their family, could afford uh, kind of these healthy foods, had access to healthy foods. Um, you know, this particular commercial showed a lean and healthy mother with also a lean and healthy daughter um, and showed an understanding of nutrition labels. I mean, they understood the nutrition labels so much that the daughter wanted to read the nutrition labels, right? And so what we saw a lot with the nutrition marketing was that there was a lot of unintentional inequity that kind of commercial marketing principles were used to show kind of the healthy lifestyle to other healthy people. Now, this commercial would be great if someone was trying to sell yogurt because I'm sure that moms like her want to buy a lot of yogurt. But if you're actually trying to solve the issue of unhealthy eating, you have to understand, well, who are unhealthy eaters? They don't look like this necessarily. Their grocery stores don't look like this. They may not have this amount of time. Their children may not be as open to eating healthy. They, may, they might have a, a myriad of obstacles that are not represented within this message. Now, this is just one of, of hundreds of nutrition-based campaigns that essentially inadvertently kind of shame those who aren't living healthy because they kind of look at that and say, well, that's not me. That's not my lifestyle. That's not what my kids are like. And I feel bad that I can't deliver that kind of life um, to them, that I can't be as healthy as they need me to be. So we said, this is not equitable. And we can't create a campaign like this if we want to achieve equitable outcomes. So what we did is we acknowledged some truths first. We said, well, most unhealthy eaters, based on our research, actually do want to eat healthier. Um, they like the idea of eating healthier. They know its benefits. They, they want to be healthy, et cetera. And, and a lot of them feel like it's something that they would do if they could. But what they would tell us over and over again, as we talked to low-income families, as we talked to individuals who didn't eat healthy, et cetera, was that they didn't know how someone in their situation, whether it was money, time, um, the tastes of their family, cultural preferences, et cetera, could realistically eat healthier. They needed help. They didn't need more examples of healthy people already being healthy. They needed examples of how someone like them could actually be healthy. So what that means is that we have to look at what are the real circumstances that those who are at greatest need have and how can we solve that problem for them? Remember we talked earlier about how is it that your communications campaign is actually reducing the burdens of change? So let's ask for that in nutrition. You know, that commercial we just saw, it didn't reduce any burdens of change. Right? It told us to go read the nutrition labels. That's an extra burden, right? So, so what are the actual burdens that we can reduce? So in order to do that, we developed a messaging model using our intentional equity framework. This particular messaging model is called Savvy, and we have a number of different messaging models all based on our intentional equity framework. But Savvy is focused on delivering what we call specific, acceptable, viable, and impactful messages. Essentially, instead of trying to deliver general messages about nutrition, we focus on what are specific changes that individuals within our, the greatest need um, can actually enact. And so we want to provide what that specific change is. We also want to make sure that that specific change is acceptable to them, that it's viable, that it's something that fits within the time and within the cost and, and place of where the, these behaviors are being enacted. Um, and then finally, that's impactful, right? If we're going to invest in a specific nutrition behavior, we want to make sure it's something they do frequently so that if they adopt it, because uh, change is hard, if they accept it, um, it will have a big nutritional impact on their life. And so based on all of this, we started looking for behaviors that our populations were enacting in and looking directly for alternatives, right? We're solving the problem for them. We're not putting that burden on them. One behavior we found was that we heard from a lot of moms that after work, after, you know, a busy day, that it's really easy for them to stop by fast food and get a family meal at a specific price point with a specific amount of time. And we said, okay, if we're trying to change a, a, an unhealthy behavior, fast food is a great one to target, but... We know that there's a specific amount of money and a specific amount of time that they are looking to spend. So what can we do to replace it? And how can we show someone like them taking on this behavior? So here's where, what we came up with. This is my mom, Sarah. She works and goes to school. And even though she's busy, she always makes time to grab dinner for our family. But today, it looks like she's changing what we usually eat. Are those french fries? Fried chicken, perhaps? Nope. She's bringing home rotisserie chicken and salad. A healthy choice that's lower in fat and low in cost, too. But will we like it? Mmm! We love it! Celebrate healthy choices that lead to more successful futures. Visit CalFreshHealthyLiving.org. So there was a lot in there, and you probably caught some of the, the cues of what made this message savvy and more equitable. First of all, we showed a realistic living situation for our audience. We heard that a lot of our audience had multi-generational families, and so we wanted to represent that. We also heard that 
our audience has all sorts of picky eaters in their home, not just their kids, but sometimes their parents, sometimes their spouses, um, all kind of being skeptical of new healthy foods. We wanted to represent that skepticism because it's real. And so we wanted to show that we've thought about that and that we've picked out a recommendation that we think your picky eaters uh, will be open to. We also wanted to show these realistic obstacles, right? The, the daughter was talking about what she expected. She expected fried chicken and french fries and things like that. And how this alternative uh, was, she would react to it and, and that she would probably like it. And finally, our recommendation, which was this rotisserie chicken with these pre-made salad, that that alternative was the same price point, was the same amount of time as the unhealthy alternative that we were trying to replace. So what did we do with that? We just ended up reducing the burden significantly. We didn't shame our audience about why they don't eat healthy. We didn't tell them, hey, you need more fruits and vegetables in your, on your plate and go figure it out. We told them exactly what they could do. This alleviates so much stress and so much burden from them for all of those who already wanted to eat healthier but were looking for an easy way to do it within their circumstances. And that's what equitable outcomes do. Now, this was focused on a very specific audience, right? We, we took insights from specific moms and implemented it. A lot of people worry about targeted messages leaving people out. But who did this message leave out? A lot of times that's a misnomer because people think that the only way to reach everybody is to do it with a generic message that's designed for everybody. But what we found over and over again is that when you dive into the real story of a real person within your population who needs help, a lot of people can identify with that. And even if this is not the specific solution that they take on, they see themselves and they see the problem solving strategy within that. And they see that, hey, if someone in that situation can do it, I can do it within my situation. I'm gonna to go to that website and see what other solutions there are that maybe fit my lifestyle better. And this becomes a much more effective route for everybody, not just our highly targeted population, but for everybody than a generic message that doesn't solve any problems. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that example. So in summary, the intentional equity framework is made up of three pillars, applied empathy, authentic narrative, and needs-based implementation. If you're able to infuse these three pillars into your program, that means that you are intentionally trying to achieve equitable outcomes. And what do equitable outcomes within health communications look like? It looks like those who need greater support from you actually being the individuals who have greater outcomes, right? Because equity, is a response to an inequitable starting point. And the only way that we achieve equity from an inequitable starting point is that we have essentially outcomes that lift up those who need the most from us. So thank you very much for your time today. And we're so excited to share this framework with you and hope that we can continue to have conversations with you about this framework. Feel free to reach out for us or to join some of our webinars that are gonna dive deeper into the intentional equity framework and how we apply it across all of our health behaviors. Thanks and take care.